Hello everyone, Servus, and thanks for joining us today to this tech talk about EMEA Product Studio. I'm Celiana Carreño, VP of Technology and Head of Product in Globant. Now I would like to introduce ourselves with a couple of videos, as probably all of you know us, so you can have more information about what we do and how we do it. But just remember that a lot of bad Everywhere You know I've seen what the world can do And it's breaking my heart in two Cause I never want to see you sad girl Don't be a bad girl Reinvention moves the world forward And that's what we do best We are Globant, the company you probably don't know, behind many of the digital transformations you do know. Globant, seek reinvention. Across the world, companies have been challenged to remain in constant evolution, transform their culture and business models, rethink their customer experiences, and take advantage of new technologies such as artificial intelligence. Companies face the challenge to become augmented organizations. At Globant, we help pave the way towards this future. We work together with businesses around the world to define their way ahead and augment their capabilities to create new approaches for processes, products, and strategies. We create agile and resistant cultures where teams not only create change, but also adapt rapidly creating exceptional experiences for millions of people. We walk along this road relying on our set of disruptors and accelerators driven by artificial intelligence. All of this boosted by our system of studios and agile pods, operating units that foster creativity and innovation. We are a native digital company focused on helping organizations rethink themselves and find their way forward through digital and cognitive transformation. The future is now and it belongs to augmented organizations. Please remember that all questions can be left in the chat of this uh, talk. We are a 19 years digital native company that partners with organization um, Next slide, please, Thomas. Next one, please. Yeah. As was saying, uh, we are a 19 years digital native company that partners with organizations end to end to leverage technology, data, people, and processes to impact business and reinvent industry with a customer and collaborator centricity. We are more than 26,000 globers around 20 countries collaborating with 800 organizations. In 2021, we had a 59% year-over-year growth with 69 average NPS score, which is above average industry. Global Star in 2003, as a response to a Latin American crisis to reinvent the technology services industry, providing top Latin American talent to the world with the, the objective to be the best high quality delivery. To make this real, we grow talent inside our studios which are deep pocket of expertise in relevant disciplines to the market like product studio, which I lead in EMEA. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, some organizations we have partnered with to create disruption are Google, when we, first, uh, we were the first partners they had sourced in 16 years of partnership with them. We also work with Disney, 12 years of partnership in innovation from Royal Caribbean in park experience, data and analytics, and EA, 14 years partnership in FIFA development and game testing, to name a few uh, uh, partnerships and, and companies we work with. Also in Open Bank, creating the first true digital bank for more than 2 million users, the Met Police Traffic in London, among other uh, companies in Europe. 
In me, our growth has been exponential. We have acquired recognizing companies in different countries, which has allowed us to expand our value proposition in the region. And of course, Romania is one of the important talent centers in which we want to grow. To meet the demand we receive for our clients, since the talent that it provides at the technological level is well appreciated. No, the last one, please. We want to start by sharing our guiding principles. Uh, these are the principles are values that come live at Globe and every day with our colleagues as well as partners. Every day we also create a culture in which transformation can be through the diversity, orientation and continuous learning with the help of our studio. Each studio represents deep pocket of expertise in the latest technologies and trends. Our studio model includes reinvention studio, which aim to revolutionize and reinvent a specific industry and the digital studios that focus on developing business models and technical capabilities on the latest technologies and trends to help you digitally transform your business. Making sure that everything we create from design to implementation will have a positive impact. Now I will tell you more about our product studio that has an important role in the reinvention of our clients. So next slide, please. Yeah, perfect. Um, we have more than 900 Glovers around the world with presence in 15 countries with a strong team in many different European countries like Romania. The mission of the product studio is none other than create and define products that help our clients to achieve their business goals and align with what the user needs and expects taking into account every detail involved in the life cycle of this product and connecting all the areas that need to participate to put a successful product in the market. Next one, please. To accomplish this, we have a great team located in different cities all over the world with different experience, skills, and specialization that use our main practices, product strategy, product delivery, and a cross practice that is product coaching to add value to our clients and project from the beginning to the go-to-market. We work with a product cycle from a strategy to build by identifying barriers and opportunities areas of the different features, including roadmap, through needs, context, habits, and user organization pain points. We did it through workshop, testing, interviews, and different tools and, and frameworks. We explore and define solutions at a technological level by knowing uh, client architecture, organization, and market needs. We understand data flow, integration with other systems and existing products. We define uh, the best solution, taking into account the dependencies with technology, the guidelines, what the market expects, the time to market we need to, to achieve, and developing a scalable product that allow us uh, to evolve the products. If uh, we go into a little detail of the approach which we work, we can see we pass through a product development cycle, starting with understanding key players, market, uh, stakeholders, and the business strategy, and last but not least, our, our target audience. With all this information, we are able to co-create uh, a product vision, a key point to know because the vision plays an important role in creating or evolving a new product feature. Uh, yeah. In order to do all this work, we have different profiles to cover the needs of our clients and projects, our business analysts and our product managers. Each one of them important and crucial and with different responsibilities and, and goals, but that need to work together in order to achieve them. Now I will leave you with my colleague, Adriana Kench, who will tell us a little more about the role and the importance of a business analyst in Globan and in the projects. Hi, my name is Adriana Kench, and I have more than 20 years of experience in IT field, playing various, in various companies, various roles, such as database developer, business analyst, product manager, project manager, and consultant. In Globant, I have a product manager role. I have played in many projects the BA role, and I realized that the beginning was very difficult in none of them. No matter what your role is, the analysis is done everywhere in IT. And, what, and that is why the business analysis topic was, is, and will remain a very important topic to discuss and improve. Today, I will talk about business analysis project checklist a list developed by me based on my experience and study, which helps you have a better start 
in all projects and play the BA role with success. Please, next slide. I'm going to start the presentation by clarifying two terms, business analysis and business analyst, to have the same understanding because the subject BA project checklist refers to them. Part of an enterprise landscape are initiatives, projects, continuous improvements, and enterprise evolution. All of these are business analysis boundaries. We can perform business analysis at the initiative level, project level, etc. The business analysis evo uh, evaluates the current state as is and through different activities define the future state, which is to be. We have three types, uh, different perspectives, three different perspectives from which we can perform business analysis. Information technology, mainly what we do in <laughs> IT companies, business architecture and business process management. Let's discuss a bit about business analyst. Next slide, please. Thank you. A business analyst is any person who performs business analysis tasks, no matter they, their job title or organizational role. They are responsible for discovering, synthesizing and analyzing information from different sources such as documentation, tasks, processes, and stakeholders. Next, please. As I have already said at the beginning, every beginning of a project is very difficult. All the time we analyze what we have done in the last time to see if this time it applies to. In all cases, like in this, no, uh, please keep the, in all cases, like in this case too, a checklist is useful tool to organize yourself. This is a good also when you go shopping. How many of you use it? After this presentation, you will already have this list completed and explained. So next time you will have a better start. Let's start with a real checklist. Next, please. This is the recommended checklist about what we will discuss today. Each item from the list may be treated in a separate presentation. And if you request this, Globant may organize future presentations. Business analysis is a very vast domain and we can discuss a lot about it. As a BA, you need to read and analyze the contract, study the existing documentation, if any, and do research, plan the requirements um, analysis, plan the stakeholders engage, uh, engagement, plan business analysis governance, plan business analysis information management, identify business analysis performance improvements, Re requirements elicitation, requirements analysis and documentation, internal requirements validation and also external requirement validation, requirements signature, clarification and support for the development team, solution evaluation and UAT, user acceptance test. In the following slides, we will describe each item from the list at a high level. Next slide, please. Read and analyze the contract. Request the contract to study the project scope and the methodology. This information tells you how to plan the analysis, the project complexity, the level of formality, and the open points which give you clues about the project risks. Avoiding doing this, you risk a lot and put the project in danger. I know a situation in which a company lost more than 1 million euros because they played a role without taking into consideration what was promised. No matter the contract type, fixed price, time and material, or staff augmentation, you have to know it and play the analyst role accordingly. Next, please. Study existing documentation and research. All documents from pre-sales need to be studied. These tell you a lot of things like scope, methodology, and involve st stakeholders. The existing system need to be presented, if any, 
This situation is when the project continues the development of an existing system or when an existing system needs to be replaced by a new one. If the domain is new to you, read about it, research on internet. You need to have a starting point with, um, your com in your conversations with the client. Be prepared as much as possible. For example, I was asked for, uh, to work for SBB Switzerland and I didn't know anything about trains. Before the first meeting with the client, I read about them and learned few terms and I requested training. Next, please. Plan the requirements analysis. Plan the high level approach based on what you know from other projects and based on the project methodology discovered from the contract. Plan the work. What kind of task do I need to do? What do I have to do? For example, stakeholders analysis. Plan the activity. What kind of activities do I need to perform um, in order to do the work? What kind of actions do I need to do? For example, elicitation, documentation, validation, review, etc. Plan the deliverables. What kind of deliver deliverables do I need to prepare? For example, a document, gyra structure, user requirements management tool, etc. Next, please. Let's talk about plan the stakeholders engagement. This represents the stakeholders analysis, basically. Sometimes the contract provides this information. Sometimes this is not very well known. Anyway, the stakeholders analysis must be done either to confirm what you have or to produce the stakeholders list. You need to identify the stakeholders roles in the project. Do not forget about the external and internal stakeholders. External stakeholders are on the client side and companies with whom your company or the client collaborates. Internal stakeholders are from your team, like the solution architect, test manager, etc. Identify the stakeholders' authority level, level of power or influence. These are very important because we need to know with whom you will sign the requirements, whose ideas must be taken into consideration and other things like that. Identify the stakeholders' collaboration. You need to know how to organize future meetings and who will be part of them and when. Working with stakeholders means more politics than you ever think. Next slide, please. Plan the business analysis governance. It identify escalation parts and key stakeholders who are decision-making authorities. Determine the change control process, how changes will be prioritized, documented, communicated, and impact analysis for the change. Plan reviews, approvals, prioritization approach, approach and work procedures. Work procedures between the BA and external stakeholders and the B, between the BA and internal stakeholders. Some useful questions for you can be, who has the authority level to approve changes? Who will participate at the requirements prioritization and when? What is the prioritization process? What is the control? Uh, change control process. Next, please. Plan the business analysis information management. This, re this refers to determine the templates which must be used for this. Check the contract, ask the client if they have mandatory templates, prepare what you have from another project and tailor them for this project. Determine the tools which must be used. Uh, and the storage access, because this is also important. For this, check the contract, ask the client, prepare what you have and come up with ideas. Determine the requirements level of details. At the beginning, use a high level approach to not scare the, the, the client and adopt, adapt it uh, during the uh, project based on the needs. Besides a contract where sometimes the approach is mentioned, 
you need to take into consideration also the maturity of the development team. This is very important. And you have to know its location. In the same office with you or not, maybe in different countries. Plan also the traceability approach, forwards and backwards. This will help everyone to understand the requirements traceability, starting from the contract until the end of the development. To determine all of this, you can use questions like, how should the information be organized? What is the level of detail at which information should be captured? And so on. Next, please. Let's talk about identify the business analysis performance improvements. Also in analysis, the performance is important. Do performance analysis. This is an ongoing process. The most important thing is to analyze what goes wrong to be able to correct things and what goes okay to continue to do those things. Analyze the business analysis results. For these prepared documents, in which to be able to show what goes wrong or slowly, you should prepare them in a measurable way. Otherwise, you will just have talks with the client and recommend new actions. To understand what you need to do, use questions like, is the business analysis approach good? Is the business analysis governance good? The collaboration between the stakeholders is good or not? And one very important question, do we have the right stakeholders to the subject? Is the business analysis information management done properly and other things like that? So we can continue with the next. Requirements elicitation. Let's clarify, because this word elicitation is a bit too complicated for, for many people. So let's clarify from the beginning what is elicitation in business analysis. The elicitation area, describes the tasks that business analysts perform to obtain information from stakeholder and to confirm results. Prepare the elicitation. This involve, involves ensuring that the stakeholders have the information they need to provide during the elicitation pro process. So ask for information before the meeting. Conduct the elicitation. Describe the work performed to understand the stakeholder needs, confirm the elicitation results, communicate the results, manage stakeholders' collaboration, describes the stakeholders' collaboration in the overall business analysis process to ensure that the BA can deliver the outcome. Use techniques like workshops, questionnaires, brainstorming, presentations, and etc. Next slide, please. Requirements analysis and documentation. Another point in our checklist is this one. During the analysis and documentation for illicit requirements, we need to analyze the illicit requirements to see if they are complete, are linked to what we have already documented, identify all misunderstandings, open points, and gaps. You may ask why you don't do it during the elicitation process. Why now? After the elicitation process is very quickly done and you don't have time to analyze everything from all perspectives. You do this after the elicitation process by analyzing everything you have. Document the requirements using the agreed template and tools. During the documentation process, new things appear which will need uh, further elicitations or reviews. If the client reviews what was documented after the elicitation, they will sometimes realize that they need something else and changes need to be done, unfortunately. Next, please. Let's talk about requirements validation. We have two types of validation internal and external. Let's talk about the internal validation. Before validation and signing the requirements with a client, the requirements must be validated internally. The validation is done by solution architect, an important stakeholder for us as a PA. This action can be done once 
or it is an ongoing process. I recommend to be done as an ongoing process. Let's talk about the validation, external valid validation. No, it's the same slide. Each piece of work must be validated by the responsible stakeholders from the client. The requirements shall be validated after each iteration when we want to close a chapter. Don't do it at the end of analysis because for sure you will have big problems. Nobody is perfect to tell you the right requirements from the beginning and to document them perfectly. Both validation types Use the same process and you have it on the screen. The stakeholders read and analyze the requirements. The BA clarifies open points, refer to the requirements. The BA or SA or the client closes, or closes all the clarified open points and the BA identifies new discovered, uh, new requirements uh, during the validation process. It is possible. Next, please. Requirement signature. Another important item in our checklist is the requirement signature. For this, we need to check the contract to see the level of formality. Even if the level of formality doesn't exist, request an informal approval, an email, and keep it. Give a period of time to the client to approve the requirements. The time depends on the complexity. After the requirements are approved and developed, all changes must go through the change request process. Inform the client about the uh, requirement signature from the beginning of the project. Like this, the, the client will be very, very serious when providing the requirements and also during the review process. Next, please. Clarification and support for the development team is another from my perspective, very, very important task of a BA. You know that what should be, uh, you know what should be done, but this doesn't help anyone if you don't deliver the message to those colleagues who will implement the product. You may say, guys, here is the documentation by I am going to the beach. Uh, fine. Even if you are a guru in the documentation and everything is written there, there are different types of people with different needs. Some of them want to hear the explanation directly for, from you, not from a document. Some of them don't, don't know how to understand the requirements because they don't have any experience with such things. Some of them have problems understanding a uh, language like English. Some of them are against everything just because, without any explanation. So this activity takes place when some requirements are developed. So don't panic, don't take it personally, just be there for them to present the requirements to the development team, to inform the development team where the requirements are located and how to read and understand them. Prepare the tasks for development, only the analysis one. The rest will be done by the technical team. Verify at the beginning all bugs to see if the testing team understands the requirements. Do this for a while until the team understands them very well to avoid mistakes. Offer support the entire team. All questions from the team must be clarified. From time to time, evaluate the solution to see if the development team does what was requested by the client. Next, please. Who are you on the development team? And this, this is about solution evaluation. Who are you? As a BA, you are the voice of the client in the team, a client who is there to help to avoid criticism. So... Evaluate the solution during and after development and testing. Raise all bugs found, respecting the working procedure agreed with the testing team. With a mention that you are not testing the solution to find all bugs, you are just verifying it to see if all the features are, are implemented. 
inform the development team of the results as soon as possible. Next, please. UAT, user acceptance test. Let's talk about it. You are an important voice in the UAT team, keeping the balance between the client and development team by following the contract and the requirements. You will participate in the UAT team meeting. You will mediate all the problems will, which appear. Set up the next steps with the client for all open points. Make sure that you, dis uh, you discuss with the invo um, involved people uh, and clarify everything from the requirements point of view. Next, please. And voila, this is our checklist as a BA, which should be used in any project. Please have it with you. Some points you will... Uh, will be more important than others, but this depends on each situation. So you have to adapt. So as a BA, I need to have this list with me in all projects. Read and analyze the contracts, study the existing documentation, plan the requirements, plan the stakeholders' engagement, so on, until the user acceptance tests. I hope this is something you will use in all your future projects. Remember that each project, we can have a separate presentation to learn about it, but now we don't have enough time to do this. So thank you. If you would like to know more about this topic, I am here to answer your question. Just put them in the chat. Thank you very much. You have my contact here in case you want to ask me questions later. So thank you. We will continue the presentation with my colleague, Tamas. Tamas? Thank you very much, Adriana. That was a wonderful, Welcome. That was a wonderful talk. And it gives me a really nice segue because if Adriana walked you through everything that you need to know from the process and hard skill side of business analysis, and arguably this applies a lot to to product management as well. Um, I'm going to take this into a bit more of the soft skill area. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Tomasz Wagner. I've been part of Globant's product studio for about roughly a year now. And right now, I'm wearing the shoes of a product manager, a product manager for the clients where I'm uh, working. And what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, communication in the shoes of a product manager. So. Firstly, um, just to put a bit of a context, product managers are the ones on a project who own the vision. And that sounds really intangible and fancy. But what I want to drive home with this talk is that the role of a product manager lies somewhere in a weird spot on the Venn diagram between different kinds of stakeholders who have different kind of um, both different kinds of functional and domain roles. So you are somebody in the project who does own the vision, but you do not make executive decisions. That, that's up to the higher ups. That's usually up to the executive committees, to various directors, various um, higher ranking uh, officers in a company. You do not sell the product to the end users. You're not out in the field trying to convince people to buy and use this product. And you're not building the product itself. You're not the one who is writing the code, who's doing the testing, who's actually uh, having their hands on the sculpting tools necessary to create this. But um, what is really important to understand is that you are the one who drives alignment through all of these different teams. And you drive alignment towards the common vision through communication. Why I want to touch on this subject is because even though it is our um, main role to create this engagement, this alignment, this enthusiasm, about a very well understood common goal. And this obviously requires us to do a lot of communication. We rarely focus on specifically improving our speech and our writing skills. And one possible reason for that I've seen across the years is that product people in general get to this role by being good communicators. It's a very, very important skill and it's a skill that you're going to be recognized for while working on projects. And it's a skill that you're going to need to 
have well put in place in order to be able to start this role. But this doesn't mean that you can just stop and focus on uh, all of the hard skills necessary to create a good and pertinent vision. You need to keep actively improving your communication. So the key takeaway I want you to uh, remain with is to create enthusiasm, you must be concise, honest, and emphatic. Of course, this is just a short, short list and three items off of a long uh, possible plate, plate of subjects. But they're not as frequently mentioned as others, and I found them to be essential in our work. So what I want to do is make sure uh, to highlight how these impact your communication. Now, the key takeaway you could actually remember, because it's short, concise, and sounds much easier to, to remember, is you need to tell a true story which is relevant to your listeners. And this applies across a pretty broad space, because you need to be doing this when you're communicating uh, with end users, when you're communicating with executives, when you're communicating with developers. You need to do it verbally, face to face. You need to do it virtually in online uh, um, forums and meeting groups. You need to do it in writing, in emails, and in direct messaging. You need to do it in user stories and specifications and all of the documents that Adriana mentioned in the talk before. So. Even though you might think of storytelling as something that you do at bedtime to your kids, it's really important to understand that everybody listens to a well-put-in-place story. A story has a well-defined structure, and it creates engagement. Facts, figures, drawings, um, walls of text all have their place sometimes. But in order to create alignment on a vision, you need to be a good storyteller. Your story needs to be true, because in order for anybody to align with you, you need to be trustworthy. And it needs to be relevant to your listener. This comes back to what Adriana mentioned about talking differently to different people. You might have a very wide story with a lot of details, but not everybody involved in the creation of the product and in driving the vision needs to know all of the details. You need to keep your story relevant to the listener. All right, so the first, I'm going to talk about the empathy part first. You might say that it's not quite empathy, it's just audience knowledge the fact that you recognize that you need to adapt your message to who you're talking to. But why I focused on the word empathy is because you don't only want people to understand what you're saying, you want people to care about what you're talking about. And there's a real difference there. For this, you need to both understand the expertise and the motivation of the people who you're talking to. Their expertise is relevant because it tells you when you need to talk to them, what kind of advice do you need from them, and what kind of vocabulary, what kind of structure, what kind of language do you use, when you're communicating with them. Uh, the motivation part is even more important because that's where the caring part comes in. Imagine everybody that I just mentioned you needing to align is heading towards a different end destination on a map. Your job is to make sure that everybody understands that in order to reach their own different destinations, your vision will take them to a place and everybody is going to benefit from going to that common place first and continuing on afterwards towards their own separate destinations. This is what alignment looks like. And once everybody understands that if they go with you where you want them to go, it's going to help their own motivation. It's going to be the perfect um, scenario for building something great together and in harmony. The second is time and attention span. There's that um, often quoted um, interesting fact about uh, Churchill and the way he, he, he managed the war. Generals were not allowed to give him anything longer than a brief of an, one single page. Now imagine having to decide the lives of possibly thousands of people and sending them to war and needing good decision validation, but only having the space of a page to do it. It sounds, it sounds really uh, constraining and it sounds possibly infuriating. And that's the same way in software uh, development. A lot of times, thank God we don't have to decide the lives of people or send them to war, but still, Sometimes you only get five minutes with a really important decision-making executive, and you might get mad that you don't have the time to explain everything that you would like to. The correct approach is to be empathetic and understand why you only have five minutes of time, because just like you, there's a bunch of other people with important things to communicate to them, and there's just not that much time that they can spare for everything. So adapt the level of detail to how much time they have and how much attention span do, do they have. Because you might find a free hour and a half in the calendar of all the development team, it doesn't mean that they're going to be listening attentively for an hour and a half if you start talking to them. 
pay attention to adapt your message so that it actually conveys what you need and it's just enough that it stays with the audience. It's kind of redundant with the simplicity part a bit, but uh, it goes a longer way. So long, complex messages often get ignored or misunderstood. And these are both problems. I don't even know which is worse, if people don't hear you or if they hear you but understand something different than you wanted to communicate. So one thing that I, uh, one pragmatic advice I can give here, it's a bit more difficult than in, uh, in speech, than in writing. But at the end of the week, I usually do a review of all the important emails or longer or more sensitive uh, DMs that I needed to send and try to evaluate how well it got the message through. And an exercise that I've been currently for a long time doing now is seeing how much I can remove from the message before it's actually not enough. And it seems like you can remove almost everything before people start getting confused. And the more you add, especially um, to a broad and mixed audience, the more chance of misunderstanding. So be sure to be concise. Uh, and it's a good way also to make sure that you get all the meaningful questions. If you come into a room of people, take a big breath of air and talk for five minutes using a lot of complicated nested sentences and logic, everybody is going to be afraid to ask a question, not to look dumb if, if everybody else understood, but they didn't. If you just come into a room and say, we're going to drop this feature completely starting tomorrow, without giving any further detail, you can be sure that everyone understood what you said, you can address the questions that come up, and you can be sure that the audience will put their um, relevant worries uh, in, in the form of questions or challenges, and then you can answer them and go into the details instead of going the other way around and giving 10 minutes of context before announcing this, just to repeat all the details again because they uh, were missed. And the third one, this seems obvious. Being honest seems really obvious and doesn't really require much thought on the surface, but if you need to bend the truth, you need to reevaluate re your position. And why I mentioned this is because there can be external and internal factors that will drive you to want to kind of bend the truth. I'm obviously not speaking about like the biblical don't lie. It's, it's not something that anybody would do. But the common situation is you come up with a, you see an opportunity, you study, you do discovery, you see a hypothesis, you create a hypothesis and you start testing it. Everything looks fine. So you prototype it, you user test it. Maybe you run through a couple of phases of development and the results are promising. You're obviously in a position where you need to keep getting buy-in from different people to get resources, time and, and, uh, and priority to continue this work. In the moment where you start seeing that you might have been wrong, even though it was promising, it's often tempting to try to either save face or just, um, or just uh, not own up to not give up or not own up to uh, potential failure, even though the evidence is to the contrary. It's a good sign that you need to stop, take a step back, reevaluate what your end goal is, and be honest with yourself and then with everybody else if the work you've put in needs a reevaluation and you need to shift direction to get where you want to be going. Same with measurements. It's really frustrating to see free graphic if you have four metrics and three of them are going perfectly the way you hoped but the fourth one is stagnating or maybe horrible you you might be tempted to present the positive results and write off the negative ones as irrelevant or maybe just hide them all together out of shame or out of uh, the feeling of pressure to perform well i put it to you that it's most important to dig into the fourth one it's the place where the most opportunities lie to dig deeper, understand better the underlying problem, why your solution doesn't fit it. And it's something that you need to bring to the surface. So please, whenever you feel the need to omit, hide, or, or bend an information, just reevaluate why you're doing this and you'll most likely find that it's not the right path to go down. Cool. So just some really quick bullet points on what we can avoid and help us immensely. Poor grammar. Number one cause of of really easy misunderstandings and a lot of back and forth and recommunication. Pay attention to use well-constructed um, well messages. Pay attention to grammar. We live in a world of quick, hurried uh, messaging. We 
often don't use punctuation, often forget about the basic structure of a sentence. It's really important to use good grammar. Lack of structure. Again, this is not always as evident in talks, but good communication has very easily scannable structure. A good talk should have a, an introduction, a, a body, and a, and a conclusion. In writing, it's much more obvious. Think of any email, any uh, direct message, any specification, any documentation you write. Think of it with the same level of detail to structure as a UX designer would looking at the screen. It needs to be easy to scan. It needs to ha have information hierarchy. It needs to have a really easy to follow line of thought for it to get the message through. Nested sentences, please avoid nested sentences. Please avoid overly complicating you know, when you end a sentence and you don't even remember where you started from because you interrupted yourself five times? Again, much more difficult to avoid in speech, but you can get there if you practice. But in writing, it's really easy to see. Anytime you see, use parentheses, anytime you have to use 20 commas in a sentence or little dashes to explain something, restructure, rethink, use indentation to your advantage, use emojis to your advantage, use whatever you can digitally to your advantage. Uncertain language. Should have, would have, should have, didn't. There's a lot of uncertainty on a product and there's always going to be lots of uncertainty and it's your job and it's uh, your role to make sure that you highlight that and you, and you know all the unknowns during a project and you include those in, in, in your vision as potential pitfalls. But don't use it in language. Imagine if Martin Luther King would have said instead of, I have a dream, you know, I kind of think I have a pretty good idea of what we should probably do. You're not going to get anybody to follow you if the language you're using about the well-defined things is trying to be apologetic or, or anticipating possible failure and just, just rounding that corner. No, you need to be very confident in what you're saying. So if you're confident of what you're saying, don't use uncertain language. Same goes for jargon and abbreviations. You need to adapt to your listeners, but in general, even if you're talking to the most technical crowd, jargon and abbreviations usually cause more confusion than, than, than not, unless it's the point of a discussion to dive into a specific detail, you're usually better off just using plain common language. And repetition, this is a tricky one. I left it last because repetition can be both bad and good. It's really bad to have repetition in the form of multiple sources of truth. And this is really, really easy to see on a project in case you have documentation in Confluence, in, you have user stories in Jira, you have acceptance test criteria in a different tool, and you have a lots of emails and direct messages on Slack channels about the same thing. So it means that wherever somebody finds this information, about a specific item, it needs to be the same, otherwise it's causing a lot of confusion. So especially digitally, please try to use linking. Uh, it's really important to have less pieces of information to update once something changes. So wherever you can, please refer back to the original source of truth for something and don't keep redundant things written down in many places, it's going to bite you back. But repetition can also be good. And this is what I try to illustrate here tell a true story which is relevant to your listener. I've already said this, but I'm saying it again because I really want you to take this away from the stock. You can sum up all that I've said and explained in this one sentence. And if you keep it in mind, it's going to help you in your written and your uh, verbal communication. And the last thing that I want to close on is a quote from one of my all time mentors in, in how to think, George Carlin, who is a comedian of all things. And he said in one of his, his specials, we think in language. So the quality of our thoughts and ideas can only be as good as the quality of the language we use to create them. What this means is that besides helping you get your message across correctly and without misunderstanding and creating enthusiasm with the way you communicate, if you improve your communication skills, you will actually improve your quality of ideas. You will have a better toolbox in your hand to come up with better and better ideas, which you can then correctly communicate. So it's not just a matter of, of um, understanding, it's also a matter of helping ourselves fulfill our full potential and get the most of our creativity when we talk about improving our communication and our language use. That's what I wanted to tell, talk to you about today. Thank you very much. 
uh, don't forget that you can post all the questions in the comments. And now I'm going to pass the word back to Saliana for the closing. Thank you very much. Oh, we cannot hear you. Saliana, we cannot hear you. I think you are on mute. Oh, so sorry. Is no David. problem. <laughs> it happens. Mission, but... oh. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us uh, today. I hope you have enjoyed this session with these incredible speakers and that you know a little more about Globant, about our product studio and what we do. And please do not hesitate to contact us if you need more information. And also remember to leave your questions in the chat and we will answer them as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.